On Mount Hamilton, 4,200 feet above sea level, overlooking Santa Clara Valley in Northern California, sits Lick Observatory, named after its donor, James Lick. Construction of Lick Observatory began July 23, 1880, and all materials had to be hauled up 19 miles of steep mountainside. Today, this small, self-sufficient community, a part of the University of California, has 75 residents, including numerous children. In 1936, University of California astronomers first expressed a desire to build a 120-inch telescope. After many years in the thinking and design stages, drawings were submitted for public bid, and the Judson Pacific Murphy Corporation of Emeryville, California, having submitted the only bid, was awarded the contract. Work, which started in July 1953, required all the technical know-how possessed by this steel firm and its associated subcontractors. This is the story of building Lick Observatory's new 120-inch telescope. The first order of business was to fabricate and assemble in the shop the many heavy steel components which made up this instrument. After six months of work in the Emeryville plant, the initial parts were ready to be set in place at the observatory, the remaining parts to follow closely behind. In the middle of January 1954, the field forces of Judson Pacific Murphy Corporation began the tortuous trek up the mountainside with the base frame of the telescope in tow. It was a cold, foggy day as the small caravan of trucks, automobiles, and a truck crane tugged and hauled this awkward, welded assembly up 19 miles of steep, narrow mountain road. Our initiation to the task which faced us was disheartening, for it took two long days to arrive at Lick Observatory. The base frame, as its name implies, was to support or cradle the entire telescope. For all the time spent in reaching its destination, this heavy weldment was handled with dispatch by the truck crane and maneuvered by it through the access doorway of the observatory. Further handling was necessary inside the building to locate it in its final position. It was a tight squeeze indeed. The next part to arrive at the mountain was the polar axle. This model will enable you to understand the position of the polar axle relative to the base frame. Weighing some 33 tons, the hollow cylindrical steel polar axle may be compared to the handle of a gigantic tuning fork. Resting on the base frame at an angle parallel to the axis of the Earth, it required the use of optical instruments in order to check its exact location. The next weldment to be maneuvered through the hatchway was the yoke. Weighing some 35 tons, this was the heaviest of all individual parts. Heavy-duty rigging, temporarily attached to the observatory dome, carried it safely into the building. Made of thick steel plate, Yet beautifully fabricated, this massive structure was no child's toy. The yoke, appropriately named, formed the base of the fork. Rigging for lifting this weldment was so arranged that it hung at the proper angle, thus facilitating its bolted connection to the upper end of the polar axle. We're now ready for the two fork arms. The fork arms were long, rectangular weldments made of heavy steel plate. They also had to be jockeyed through the small hatchway, and when connected to both ends of the yoke, formed the tines, or arms, of the fork. These arms, like all the other steelwork for this instrument, had been fabricated by Judson Pacific Murphy Corporation, heated in Bethlehem Pacific's huge ovens in order to relieve welding stresses, machined by Oakland Machine Works, and fitted up at Todd Shipyards, an excellent example of an industrial team in the San Francisco Bay Area, pooling its resources and know-how. With the arms safely bolted in position, the telescope began to take shape. But no one could deny that it was indeed a strange-looking sight. One of the basic actions of the telescope could now be produced. This was called right ascension, 
It was the rotation of the entire fork about its polar axis or handle. In this instance, the hoisting equipment was used as a source of power. However, in the final stages of completion, a huge gear would permanently rotate the fork assembly. The entire fork, weighing some 100 tons, was supported by oil pads, which were part of the base frame. A hydraulic pumping system forced oil under pressure to these pads. Electrically operated panels and valves controlled the flow of the oil. An oil film two thousandths of an inch thick, or the thickness of a piece of paper, supported the entire result. There was no metal-to-metal -metal contact. Friction was so slight that man could rotate this entire assembly with very little effort. What had appeared to many to be an impossibility was now, in fact, a reality. A good deal of thought had been given to planning our next move. Just how would we install the large tube assembly? This was a strange looking cylindrical structure made of heavy pipe, which, when in place, was supported between the two arms of the fork. We decided to assemble the tube on the floor and raise it in two large sections. The upper half is shown going into place. Just what did this tube do? Well, in one sense, it might be considered the heart of the telescope, for it supported a large mirror at its lower end and a place for the observer and his equipment at the upper end. The tube, nested between the two fork arms, could be rotated by a large gear some 12 feet in diameter. This gear is called the declination gear. Engineers and mechanics worked hand in hand endeavoring to attain the dimensional fit-up and accuracies that this tube assembly required. Although we had worked our way in building this telescope from the basement of the observatory to the upper reaches of the dome, there was more yet to be added. Connected to the top of the tube was the prime focus cage. This weldment of high precision housed a small compartment or cell wherein an astronomer could sit while he operated the entire telescope for the purpose of observing a star. The instrument was fast beginning to take shape, but little did we realize the problems yet to face us. The observer's cell was supported at the center of the prime focus cage. Here, the light of the star reflected from the mirror below would come to a focus, thus enabling the astronomer to take a photograph of the star. Once again, the sequence of work brought us back to the confined area at the rear of the telescope base frame where the right ascension gear in protective wrapping had been stored for many months. This attached to the south end of the polar axle or fork handle, which extended into the basement of the observatory. Western Gear Corporation had manufactured this four-ton gear at their Linwood, California plant with accuracy requirements similar to those of a delicate watch. It was no small wonder then that this masterpiece in gearing valued at $100,000 was handled with kid gloves. Spectators on the mountain heaved a sigh of relief when the gear was permanently located. Of the many strange terms associated with this instrument, one of the most unusual was the right ascension cradle. As shown here, this intricate piece of machinery, manufactured by Oakland Machine Works, contained the worm gearing, which when positioned properly would motivate or drive the large right ascension gear. These scenes show the cradle being moved into position directly under the gear. The alignment of these wires and cradle relative to ascension gear was a long, tedious job, which taxed the patience and engineering ability of all concerned. After many months of adjustment, we were ready to operate the entire gear system. Very cautiously, the right ascension drive mechanism was energized. 
while astronomers, engineers, and mechanics closely observe the mating action of the gears which turn the entire telescope in right ascension. This mechanism would allow the instrument to or follow a star in its course through the heavens. Immediate success in this operation was far beyond our grasp, for problems in gearing and lubrication presented themselves which could only be solved by trial and error methods. Yet, experimentation with so valuable a piece of equipment must not result in damage to its accuracies. A year passed. And seasonal changes were drastic for those men who spent all of their time and energies on this job. After extensive study and trial, we were able to give the astronomer the compatibility and wearing qualities in this gearing that he must have. A lapping or polishing operation shown here was the final step. Gear accuracies had been maintained. The mechanical operation of the telescope was now complete. The model shows the location of the mirror at the lower end of the tube. All of the optical work in conjunction with this telescope was performed by University of California opticians and astronomers. Special handling equipment was required in order to raise the four-ton mirror in place. This huge piece of Pyrex glass, 120 inches in diameter and 16 inches thick, had been ground and polished on its top side to a highly accurate concave surface. A cover protected the polished surface, which had yet to be illuminized so that it might reflect light. The telescope, having been positioned properly, would function in this manner. The light of the star under observation would travel down the tube to the concave mirror, where it would be reflected back to the observer's cell. Here, a photographic plate exposed to the reflected light would result in a photograph of the star. The right ascension movement of the telescope, shown here, enables the instrument to accurately track or follow a star as it moves in the heavens with respect to the Earth. Exposure time of a photographic plate to the reflected light depends upon the star's magnitude or brilliance. In some instances, exposure may be as long as five hours. During this time, the instrument must follow the star with extreme accuracy. Failure to do so would result in a blurred and therefore unacceptable photograph. Declination, as applied to the telescope, is the rotation of the tube between the fork arms. This movement also enables the astronomer to position the instrument on the star which he wishes to observe. A console houses all of the electrical equipment and controls whereby the telescope is automatically operated. The entire dome of the observatory rotates, thereby giving the telescope a complete view of the night sky. Therefore, when the astronomer, seated in the observer's cell, has on a chosen night tracked a star and taken its picture, he has provided for himself and his associates a permanent record, which with the aid of special equipment may be studied at a later date. This, then, is the story of the new 120-inch reflector telescope, which stands today in all its greatness on top of Mount Hamilton, California. The story of industry working hand in hand with science to solve those problems that stand in the path of man's reaching for the stars.